just start by giving me your name and spell your last name and your title. Okay, I'm uh, Justice Arthur Gilbert, uh, and I am the presiding justice of the California Court of Appeal Division VI of the Second District. The successor to my uh, to the gentleman sitting across me. And Justice Stone, if I could have your name and spelling. And sure. Your title. I'm Steve Stone, uh, uh, S-T-O-N-E. I'm the uh, former presiding justice of the Court of Appeal, uh, Division Six, and I'm sitting here uh, going to have a conversation with my my successor and contemporary, Art Gilbert. Well, this is part of the uh, Appellate Legacy Project in which we take oral histories of, uh, of prominent justices of the Court of Appeal um, for uh, future generations, for their either amazement uh, and, I hope, uh, enlightenment. So, uh, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing uh, Stephen Stone, who was the, um, the first uh, presiding justice of Division VI of the Court of Appeal uh, uh, in the Second District. And here we are sitting in my chambers, or is this your chambers, Steve? Our chambers, I think. It's yeah. our chambers because... You inherited them from me. I did. And in fact, this chambers um, that we're sitting in now, it's a rather spacious, it has an octagonal shape to it, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It's uh, sitting on the corner of the building um, overlooking Old Ventura. And you, uh, mm. this was your office uh, when uh, we first moved into this building. Uh, do you recall when that was? In 1994. 1994, and we'll talk a little bit later about that. You were instrumental in getting this building and, and helping design it and building for yourself the most uh, spacious and uh, opulent chambers I've ever seen. Uh, and I resisted moving into these chambers, you know that. Yes, I know you <laughs> did. <laughs> but I don't but know whether the, that was uh, 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 for show or for go, Arthur, yes. but... Uh, it is, these are very nice chambers, and, and actually uh, when we were uh, designing the building, and all of us participated in the design, uh, it was uh, actually the developer and architect or uh, designer uh, who thought that this would be a good uh, setup for the presiding justice. To, no no, no question. Well. In fact, we all agreed on this, and, uh, and in fact, uh, I really encouraged this uh, chambers to be built because I was hoping it just could be that someday I might inherit this from you if you would retire. I think uh, we all agreed <laughs> that it was, it was uh, pretty awful. It was a, a little embarrassing, for, uh, frankly, for me to, to be in here I, because uh, it, it's uh, unlike our, our rather uh, modest lives we've led uh, uh, throughout. So, um, so Steve, so um, let's see, our division was um, created in 1982. It was quite a fight in 1982 uh, because if, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, the legislature had authorized uh, this division uh, to start early in 82, uh, except that uh, there were some people that uh, didn't want uh, the then governor, uh, Jerry Brown, uh, to make the appointments. That's, that's and they right. instituted some lawsuits to prevent it. In fact, it was before 1982. It was before 1982. Yes, it was. That's correct. I believe it was 1980 or 81 that this division and Division 7 uh, and some other divisions in the state were created. And some of the legislators fought it, didn't they? That's right. The, and not only the legislators, but uh, uh, the Republican Party as a party filed lawsuits uh, in order to uh, hopefully postpone the appointment of the justices until a new administration uh, uh, took pl uh, was seated. That's right, and we had word that we were at least slated uh, to be uh, nominees for this division, and so uh, our appointments were put on hold for a couple of years. They were they were delayed, and of course, uh, the shifting alliances of politics and uh, uh, things uh, it was never certain. Uh, first of all, whether we would ever be appointed uh, or whether uh, the appointments would come in time for us. That's right. And the case uh, wound its way up. I think there was a judge in, was it El, a Superior Court judge in El Dorado County? Do you Could recall have been. that? Could have been. I think, yeah, some, some county, you know. Who, uh, that didn't care. <laughs> yeah, that didn't care or didn't want us. And ruled that it was unconstitutional for, I can't, I don't f remember the rationale for the decision. And it worked its way up to the Court of Appeal. And I believe it was the um, Sacramento. It was. Uh, uh, division. Uh, Justice Pooley, I think, wrote the 
opinion. Am I right about that? Yeah, I, I think, and, and it was rather remarkable because Justice Puglia, uh, generally his uh, judicial philosophy and his political philosophy, philosophy was so different uh, than uh, Governor Brown's, uh, but he was a man of great integrity and uh, judicial honesty. And uh, he saw that it was, the, the blockage, blocking was merely political and uh, was uh, poorly grounded and uh, ruled in favor of uh, Jerry Brown making the appointments. That's right. That's right. I do uh, remember that. Uh, yeah, I, I owe you big, Phil. <laughs> I owe both of you big. <laughs> so uh, we were talking about Justice uh, Apulia, who wrote the decision, and you mentioned that he was a person of great integrity. He uh, was. And uh, I was, yeah, I think we all respected him. Uh, great, great integrity great. and occasional temper. Yeah, an occasional temper and wit. He was a really yeah. a first-rate justice. He was one, uh, Justice Puglia was uh, one of the smartest yeah. persons and certainly smartest uh, justices I ever met. And uh, there are a lot of smart justices, yeah. in, but, but he was outstanding. And, and uh, he was a, a, of enormous assistance to me when we were all establishing this division because none of us had ever been here before. Right. And I would call on uh, Justice Puglia from time to time for advice and counsel, and it was always sound. So he now, so he wrote the opinion, and the opinion um, upheld the governor's um, appointment process and mm -hmm. the constitutionality of the formation of these divisions. And this was at the end of Jerry Brown's term. Right, running I, out I, of time. It was 1982, and then he had to make the appointments, and then they had to set up um, mm -hmm. our um, um, confirmation, uh, confirmation hearings. Which w and those occurred, you remember when I remember I, that? I remember, I December, think December exactly, 27th. 27th, wow, just at the end of the term. We were appointed, I think, in the first week of December. Yes, right. And uh, we then had to organize ourselves in a way as to, uh, to, uh, to meet the demands of the confirmation hearings. Right. And uh, you and I, I know, spoke on the phone a few times. Yes. Uh, and we met and we discussed uh, the, he uh, the upcoming hearings. Uh, knowing that they could be a challenge. Right, because um, what had happened, if you recall, now it's all coming back to me, um, the Attorney General at that time was, um, was um, uh, Duke Majin, who uh, became the governor. Yes, he was going to be seated within weeks. That's right. Uh, of our confirmation hearing. And he had sent a letter to us and to other justices earlier in the year about their judicial philosophy and asking questions regarding how we might rule on certain cases. Do you recall did. that? And he did uh, that. And, and we had some real problems with the letter. Yes, we, we, uh, uh, the letter asked for uh, answers to questions in a way uh, which would indicate to he and the public uh, how we might rule in the future on cases that come before us. And we had discussions about that because there was a feeling certainly uh, certainly I, and I think you too, uh, felt that we uh, could not and should not answer those questions, uh, at least directly at all, um, because it's uh, generally considered not, it's considered unwise to say things which might give you predictability in the future uh, in a sense of prejudging a case. Um, predictability is, is perfectly all right, but not in any given case. It could be since we're supposed to consider the evidence in the law at the time. And we were trying to think of answers that would uh, indicate our feelings about that, but without antagonizing uh, Attorney General Duke Majin or anyone else, but simply to indicate uh, how we felt about it in an intellectual way. That's, that's tr right. I, that, that comes back. Now, I recall he had sent, he had modified his letter to us uh, in the sense that it was, um, less offensive than the letter that he had sent earlier appointees. Yes. Um, because there was some criticism and it was in the press, I recall that. And some justices um, or a, a potential nominees or at that time, uh, not potential nominees, they were nominees but they won't, hadn't been confirmed yet, had said, um, none of your business, we refuse to answer. That's and right. And you and I were far more diplomatic, weren't we? Yes, we, uh, <laughs> uh, we thought uh, we didn't have to uh, it was not the time or place to challenge the propriety of the questions, uh, except in a mild and intellectual response. And so um, we wrote uh, respectful uh, replies, 
and explained mm -hmm. our position and to the questions we could answer, we did. Yes. And you know, it's ironic, we all became really good friends with him afterwards. And he's yes. a really a, turned out to be just a wonderful uh, gentleman. Um, he, uh, I thought he was a fairly credible governor. I mean, I, as a governor, he, he, he wasn't, I'm, we're both Democrats and well, certainly didn't vote for him, but I found him to be a person of integrity and honesty, and I, I really uh, admired him. That's, that's correct. Uh, he uh, uh, he had, a, had a very strong conscience and a, and a strong philosophy, uh, but he, uh, he had an open mind, and he could listen, and he did indeed and in fact listen. And um, now you were confirmed. I was confirmed, and so was Richard Abbey. We were all confirmed and on the same day. We can talk about this later when we talk about Richard Abbey, because there's some funny mm -hmm. things there. But uh, he had voted against some other people, uh, but he did vote for us. And the uh, hearings, how, how would you characterize the hearings? I thought, uh, I thought the hearings were exciting for me. Uh, interestingly enough, I was not nervous about it. I, I was, let me put it this way, I was nervous but not anxious because uh, I, I felt, uh, I, I actually felt all of us would be confirmed, although whether it was going to be uh, two to one or, or three zip uh, was uncertain. Now, who was on the panel uh, that was voting for us? It was uh, uh, Lester Roth, who was the senior That's right. uh, justice of the, uh, in the second district. It was uh, Attorney General Duke Majin uh, and Rose Byrd. That's right. And uh, they, they were our three interrogators. That's right. Uh, and uh, uh, they were very interesting. I can't remember the sequence uh, of who went forward, but I think there was six of us uh, to be confirmed or not uh, I think that day. Were, I think there were more. The Orange County Division and The Orange us. County Division. Oh, and there. Division 7. And also the Supreme Court, uh, uh, Joseph Groden. Six. I think Groden had his was hearing. Was he with us that day? I think he was with us that day. He might was have gone he? first. Am I? I think so. Or I don't recall that, but there were, there were nine justices of the Court yeah. of Appeal to be confirmed. Right. Uh, and uh, so it was a long and interesting day, and uh, it was fascinating for me. Uh, I had never known a Court of Appeal justice, much less been one. <laughs> yes. uh, and uh, the only one I happen to know was Ed Beach, who we'll deal with later today. But um, uh, meeting our colleagues was a lot of fun, and and I think we because we were all new and forming three new divisions, uh, we had a bonding of uh, uh, in the sense that we were uh, inventing something new in a way, uh, trying to keep with the traditions of the old. Uh, yet none of us had the help of existing justices sitting with us. And it was a, uh, a welcome challenge, I think, for all of us. We were very eager, and I think it came with our youth. Yes. Uh, youth, ah, uh, yes. Yes, I. That was only, what, 32 years? No, no, it no, wasn't. No, it wasn't that long. No, no that's how long we've been on the bench. It was, what, 26 years ago? 20, it was 1982. And 1982? So. 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Quarter of a century. Ago. Wow. See, pardon it the seems, in, in part, <laughs> it seems like yesterday, and in part, it seems like... Uh, ages and ages ago. So now, as I recall, ab well, after our hearings, um, you and I got together. And I remember sitting in a restaurant with you in Cheerios. Yes, it was, a, it was a rainy day. Yes. And I had come down from Ventura to Santa Monica. And we, I met you in your chambers. And we said, we've, let's and go someplace so we can talk yeah. about uh, our future. Exactly. Uh, now, was this be, I don't recall, was this before our hearings or after? I think it was before our... I think was, was it just before or after? I, I don't recall now. I think it was before. I think it was before. Yeah. And... But it, it was uh, in December or early January. Yeah. Okay. It was, uh, but it was, it was just, a cold and wintry it was, day. Yeah, it was raining. I think or as the book, uh, as we start our books, it was a dark and stormy yes. time. <laughs> we started writing our autobiographies. So now we weren't really enthralled about being appointed to the Court of Appeal, were we? Well, no, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, I had been on the, on the Superior Court since 1976, so that was only six years, five or six years on the Superior Court. And... Uh, I absolutely loved my work on the Superior Court. Um, I had a ringside seat 
They had a replay of the human drama. Uh, and I was in full control. I wasn't an advocate. And I, and I really enjoyed that. And I, uh, I enjoyed what we did. I thought it was important to the people we served. And uh, uh, it, it was a delightful experience, I thought. And when uh, our names went out for the Court of Appeal, and I'm, and I'm sure like you, Arthur, we were asked if we would do it. And, I, and frankly, I gave it a little bit of thought, but I knew that you can't pass up these opportunities, uh, these career opportunities, because if you do, you may never have the opportunity again. And uh, so I, uh, like you, uh, agreed to, to be a nominee if that's uh, what the governor wanted. Uh, but it was with uh, not we we accepted this uh, eagerly, but not without reservation because we knew we would miss the give and take of the human contact of the trial court, uh, where we we actually dealt with on a face to face, nose to nose basis with uh, people really affected by the judicial system. That is the litigants. Uh, they were before us in the in the, in seated in court. Uh, we made our rulings, looking at them in the eye, and it was uh, uh, a task which uh, I think I know you welcomed and I welcomed as difficult as it was. And we were giving that up for the intellectual challenge of the Court of Appeal, uh, which has its own attractions. Uh, but it was, it was uh, we thought, a mixed blessing, but in the end, uh, I... Uh, what, what made the Court of Appeal uh, such a remarkable experience for me. It was 17 of the best years of my life, professionally speaking, and it had to do primarily not with the task, but with my colleagues, uh, you and Richard, and uh, then Paul and Ken and the rest of us. Uh, uh, that was an opportunity. Whatever positions we might have held, it was really, I thought, the core of my joy. We had, a, we had a wonderful time together and maintained a very close friendship throughout the years that we still have. So it's really fortunate. Yeah, and it was a friendship born of, of intellectual uh, challenge and dialogue and trialogue, if there's such a word. Uh, those are the kinds of things when, when we're dealing with matters that are important to other people and trying to do the right thing that I think uh, uh, brought out the best in us. Uh, and. Uh, never the worst in us. It's remarkable. You know, it was kind of funny. I recall uh, Clay Robbins was the clerk of the court then. Yep. And you and I were unsure about the job. And I remember we were, you know, most people are like, they're, they're screaming with joy and they're on cloud nine. Yeah. And we're very reflective thinking about it. I remember Clay Robbins said something to it. You guys have just been appointed to a job that people would kill for, and you look like you're going to a funeral. I remember he said that. And yeah. uh, we laughed and got together and then saw what a wonderful It was experience. also, though, the, the uncertainty of uh, wanting to do it right, uh, but we were uncertain because we really had very little guidance. Uh, we, I mean, we had wonderful guidance from our colleagues uh, in other divisions, and we sought them out and we, we used them. and. Uh, but uh, it was, uh, I think one, to the, to the extent we had success, uh, I think a lot of it was because we were new and we were not bound uh, by, not so much tradition, but we were not bound by uh, any feelings that we had of having to do things the way other people did in a, in a division. Uh, we, we were free to, freer to expand, I think, than might otherwise have been the case. And under your leadership, I think we really established a very unique uh, uh, division that was sui generis and is to this day. Well, I was, I was a titular leader. Yeah. Uh, and I think the leadership was shared by all of us. And one of the reasons, we all listened to each other uh, with respect. And in fact, we got you to stop smoking. Yes, I yes. think one of the great and accomplishments. I that was, uh, <laughs> I probably wouldn't be here but for uh, <laughs> the pressure of you and Richard. Um, I do have or I'd be here with oxygen. We, um, uh, we'll, uh, uh, that was a great story because I remember um, you uh, had smoked and during your confirmation hearing, Richard and I were sitting listening to you and you were talking, uh, they mentioned the things, some of your many accomplishments. 
and one of them was you were a chairperson of the, of the American Heart Association. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, and Richard and I looked at each other. We said, we have to put a stop to this right yeah. away. Times change quickly. Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, but, you know, we'll talk about how the division developed, but I'd like to go back a little bit in your life to see your formative years, um, uh, how you got into law and, uh, and how you eventually got on the court, and then maybe we can talk a little more about the Court of Appeal, sure. if that's all right. So now you are a twin. Indeed I am. And uh, I, uh, there's a friend of mine who had appeared in front of your brother, who was a superior court judge in Santa Clara, and said, my God, I couldn't believe it. Steve Stone is, was sitting in uh, Santa Clara. He, thought, he actually thought the brother was yeah. Huey. Well, you, you raised an interesting uh, uh, little story when uh, in the late 70s, uh, my brother Peter was on the, as you say, a Santa Clara County Superior Court judge and I was a Ventura County Superior Court judge. And uh, I and my family, we went north uh, to spend a few days uh, uh, with my brother. And uh, we thought we'd, and it was during the week. And uh, so I went to work with my brother one day uh, to his Superior Court, and we decided to switch. And uh, I, let's say he was doing the law and motion calendar, and uh, the law and motion calendar, you always have somewhere between 40 and 80 lawyers in the courtroom all uh, clamoring to be heard in a way and have their motions heard. And instead of my brother coming out on the bench at 9 o'clock in the morning, I did, uh, pretending to be uh, my brother because we were identical twins, or are identical twins. And at that time, we looked pretty much exactly alike, uh, at least from a distance of 30 or 40 feet. So I took the bench and uh, um, to call the first case, and uh, the lawyers came up and started arguing their case, uh, and my brother, wearing his robe, burst out the side door into the well of the courtroom, uh, screaming at the, all of the lawyers in the audience and pointing wildly at me on the bench, claiming that I was an imposter and he was the real Judge Peter Stone, and I stood up and said, no, I'm the real judge. Peter Stone, and there was instant chaos in the courtroom. <laughs> it was just uh, one of those, I guess, uh, looking back from somebody my age, a childish trick. No, it's but it was I a lot of fun. It. That's what we do here. <laughs> That's the ambience that we've uh, you've established here. No, so, but but, so, but but we were. Uh, it's interesting, and my brother and I always use this same hackneyed line that uh, both being judges, it must be a, it must be a uh, genetic defect. Yes, uh, but. Uh, uh, our career paths, as a matter of fact, our lives have been not dissimilar. Although we live uh, uh, 400 miles apart and have since uh, we were probably uh, uh, 22 years old. I think you should submit to a study, the two of you, because how you, I mean, they have all these studies uh -huh. of twins and how they'll be million, uh, thousands of miles apart and do some of the same things and get married on the same day and all these kind of odd things happen with twins. Uh, an odd thing happened because the two of you were headed for another profession uh, yes, other than the law profession. Yes, we had, uh, uh, we were uh, a family of immigrants. Uh, uh, we were both born uh, in Austria, in Vienna, and we came out during the war through the underground uh, as Jewish refugees. And uh, we had the, what was uh, a not uncommon refugee experience. We came to New York. And uh, the first thing we did in New York was choose a name. Uh, incidentally, uh, how, how old were you then? Uh, we were uh, three, uh, three years old. We were born in 1937. We started our exodus uh, uh, in late 1939. And we ended up in 1941 uh, in Stockton, California, where uh, we started our new lives. Now, Stockton of all places. What? Yes, a dusty farm town in Central California. I mean, here you are in New York, this bustling yeah. metropolis. And, and our, name, uh, our name at the time, uh, our name was uh, Zilberstern. That was our last name. And my dad concluded quickly uh, that it was not a name that was uh, uh, very easy to assimilate with. And my parents, having gone through the, uh, the early part of the Holocaust, uh, thought it was very important to assimilate. That was the ethos of the time. And uh, so my dad, uh, mom and dad went to the phone book and uh, they boiled down the name uh, between Scott and Stone. They ended up with Stone. 
And uh, one of the first things we did in New York was legally change our names uh, to Stone. And then through the refugee organizations, uh, my mom and dad had to find work. And a job came up in Stockton, California on a ranch. Uh, my dad had been a banker in Europe, and it didn't translate well here. Uh, so he became a bookkeeper on a ranch. Uh, my mom uh, was a teacher, uh, a preschool teacher uh, uh, in Vienna with Maria Montessori. Uh, she, oh my uh, she taught with Maria Montessori and Anna Freud in the early years of Montessori experimentation. And uh, so when she came to California, uh, she went back to school at what was then the College of Pacific, now University of Pacific, and got her teaching credential in the late 40s and began a career as a teacher in Stockton. So we grew up in Stockton, and it was my parents' uh, dream uh, that we'd be doctors. Uh, so, uh, being relatively obedient children, we took that path and studied science. And uh, after high school, we went to the University of California at Berkeley and took pre-med. And in our third year of pre-med, we were accepted uh, to medical school at the University of California, which in those years, the first year was on the Berkeley campus, and the next three years were in San Francisco at what became UCSF. And uh, so we both entered medical school at the end of our junior year. And uh, so our senior year at Berkeley was also our first year of medical school. And uh, all the classes were on the Berkeley campus. There were a couple of exceptions we went to San Francisco, but uh, it became clear to both my brother and I that it was not something we really wanted to do to spend our lives doing. Uh, we had worked in a hospital as part of our education, uh, not a formal education, we worked, we worked at the San Joaquin County General Hospital in the summers, uh, at night doing uh, in the emergency uh, room as well as other wards. Uh, and when I was in Berkeley, uh, uh, we came from rather modest uh, financial backgrounds. I worked at Berkeley and I worked at Cowell Hospital, which was on the campus. And uh, it became clear to us uh, during our first year in medical school that uh, we weren't at all sure this was a, a life's work. So we looked at some of doing some other things. And at the end of our first year, we sort of crossed the street and, and uh, simply went to Hastings and took up law. And okay. neither of us had ever met a lawyer before. That's but we thought that it was, <laughs> it was a, uh, a profession in which we worked directly with people. Uh, working with people's problems, not dissimilar from medicine in a way. Uh, but uh, that's what we decided to do, and we did it. Wow. To oh. the temporary chagrin of our parents. Like, uh -huh. uh, the, mo the, the only scary thing about it really was that it was we worried about uh, potential wrath of our parents, which never, n never, never really happened. Now, now, did the two of you consult together or yeah, about we did doing this? Together. this? So, so you oh, did yeah. this, this was a joint. Uh, now projects so absolutely because, or a joint decision yeah until that time we had lived together uh, completely in at Berkeley uh, although we weren't in the same room we were at Bowles Hall uh, and uh, we had an apartment together our fourth year at Berkeley and then my brother got married and uh, uh, after he was married and during our first year at Hastings we lived in the same apartment house in San Francisco for goodness sakes uh, and then our lives uh, started spreading out. But we sat, because uh, in, in law school, it's alphabetical how you sit. We sat next to each other for three solid years uh, in law school. And uh, it was it? only after law school that uh, uh, we really uh, uh, separated uh, geographically. My brother stayed uh, in Northern California, and I came to Southern California. Now, um that's a, that, that's really quite quite an amazing story. In law school, were there any other um, any confusion about the two of you answering questions? Uh, yes, uh, because you're sitting next to each other. Uh, we were because uh, occasionally the professors would say, uh, you know, they come up with their usual hypothetical question and to terrorize the students with, and they would call on Mr. Stone, and uh, one of us would usually say, which Mr. Stone, and of course we learned quickly that was the wrong thing to do because the professor would say, you. Yeah. Um, but uh, 
uh, there was occasional uh, confusion, and uh, uh, but it was always fun. Uh, I think my brother and I—I I, I can't speak for him, but yes, I can. Uh, I, think I can speak for him. We we enjoyed the experience. Uh, in a way, it set us apart uh, and gave us something to talk about uh, to the girls uh, and that sort of thing. So, and we always had fun. We were best friends, yeah. and we still are. I can't help. Matter, as okay. a matter of fact, in 48 hours, uh, we're going to go up and meet my brother uh, at Lake Tahoe, where we're going to take a week's vacation together. Terrific. Uh, I can't help but ask this question. Did you ever um, switch off and uh, appear at each other's dates? No. Come on. Are you sure? Uh, no. <laughs> I've always thought about that, you know. One Quinn has a date. And then the other twin no. will go in that place. That we place. we would fake it once in a while, but but never on a day. Yeah. It, it, we just never. Uh, I think we were too. Uh, uh, too much integrity, huh? Shall I say no, that? No, no. <laughs> I. You can say that, uh, but it wasn't the integrity thing. It was the uh, insecurity of <laughs> dating. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, we didn't want to. Uh, there were too many ways to mess up a date. Uh, we didn't want to want to, want to, to add, add to one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, what I recall, I just have to throw this aside in, and that is uh, during our uh, time together on the court, all of us, whenever any of us had a medical problem, we'd always go to you <laughs> for advice. So that medical school... Uh, and you always got what you paid for. <laughs> have, 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 ...had a lingering effect. Um, and uh, indeed it still does, because I, I, I have maintained... Uh, my interest in medicine, uh, when, I was on the, when I was a lawyer, uh, I emphasized uh, medical legal practice, both in uh, uh, medical malpractice cases, as well and as the years went on, I, I came to represent doctors in their business matters and their family matters. Uh, then in the trial court, I always looked forward uh, to dealing with uh, uh, medical legal matters. As they, as they came through the courts and in the Court of Appeal, I always enjoyed uh, medical legal matters, including uh, uh, the first DNA case, uh, People versus Axel. I, That's right. I took great uh, interest in that case and spent a lot of time doing that. I remember you were, we had, um, we had a lot to read on that. You were, I was on that panel with you. Mm, yes, you were. And that was the first DNA case in California, very significant mm -hmm. case that you wrote. And that uh, we had to come up to speed. It was one of the longest, since it was the yeah. first case, uh, I felt uh, that it was important uh, to lay out the scientific background in lay terms to the best that I could so that people reading the opinion could understand what DNA was all about and why uh, it was important and why its identification process was sound enough uh, so that people could make life and death decisions. Uh, based on DNA scientific evidence, and it was a challenge, and it was a it was a particular challenge that I welcomed. Um, the research attorney I worked with on the case uh, uh, came up to speed quickly. She had been married to a doctor, and had some basic knowledge of basic science uh, to uh, give her a start on it, and uh, it was uh, a fascinating experience. I I remember taking a week's vacation in Palm Springs and bringing all of the scientific material with me and sitting poolside poring over uh, DNA studies and uh, transcripts of experts. A fascinating case. And trying but, to bring us up to speed on it, your colleagues up to speed on yeah, it. Well, that was the hopeless <laughs> task. <laughs> just, just kidding, so, Arthur, just kidding. So um, is there anything else in your childhood that you'd like to, um, that you think well, it was, might uh, be you know, uh, I had a, what I think was uh, a typical American upbringing, but it was different because we were immigrants. And uh, uh, because of the horror of the Holocaust, it was, as I think I said before, important for my parents that we assimilate because uh, they saw firsthand what happened, what can happen uh, to people who are different, whether it, be, whether it be by race, religion, culture, or anything else. But being different, there was a penalty uh, in Europe at the time, and that penalty was life and death. Uh, and uh, so uh, they tried to minimize our differences and maximize 
uh, our similarities with that of our culture. And it was uh, an interesting life in that respect. Uh, we wanted to uh, honor and cherish uh, our Jewish heritage, uh, yet we also wanted to protect ourselves uh, from the dangers of being marked again. And it was uh, certainly much more interesting for and difficult for my parents than it was for my brother and I. We were children, what do we know? Uh, so it didn't really, um, uh, I, I think, impact us except uh, subliminally at the time. It wasn't overt, uh, it was uh, uh, covert in a way. But it, 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 it uh, I think, launched in me, or instilled in me, a, a love of this country that I think native-born Americans uh, don't really have. I think native-born Americans tend to take uh, their freedom for granted, and we never did. And uh, it's a marvelous country, and uh, when I look back on my life, uh, only in America. And uh, that sensitivity um, has shown through your work as, um, as a judge, certainly. It has certainly influenced me. I. Uh, the uh, uh, one of the, the the being a judge and the judicial process is frankly more than dispute resolution. Uh, there are, are a number that one of one of many judicial philosophies is that judges uh, and juries merely resolve disputes. Uh, I disagree with that. It goes far far deeper than that. Uh, the judicial system, in my view, in this country especially, is the last bulwark between uh, the people uh, and a potentially oppressive government. Uh, uh, make no mistake, I am not a conservative in the conventional sense of keeping government out of our lives. Uh, I believe in keeping uh, 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 in a separation between the government and ourselves in terms of oppression not necessarily regulation. Uh, I, I know firsthand what can happen uh, in a country in which the government is all powerful and too powerful uh, because it, uh, it, that's the, that was the Holocaust. Uh, and, I, and I think uh, the people are entitled uh, to have a screen between the government uh, and themselves and that's what the judicial system is. They're unelected. They are accountable, uh, but being unelected in the sense uh, they don't have to respond to a mob, to, to a, what, what, what can be uh, an out-of-control majority. They're there to, with the law and the Constitution, uh, using those as weapons uh, uh, against a potentially oppressive government. And I think that's very important. I think we have to keep that in mind. And uh, uh, I treasure that, and I value that, and I uh, and I have and I really, really have welcomed the opportunity to be a part of that protection uh, of the people. And I think my my uh, experience as an immigrant uh, heightened that. Now you, um, so after you graduated from law school. Um, what happened? What and I really did graduate from law you school, did. Arthur. And you actually and passed the bar. And I actually passed the bar. I, I still find that hard to believe. But now, when did you take the bar exam? I took the bar in 1961 and uh, passed and uh, took the oath. Uh, I think it was in, in early January 62 uh, that I took the oath uh, in Los Angeles um, at the mass swearing in Yeah. Uh, at the Dorothy Chandler uh, Head, which has just opened. And uh, that's right, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Now they're re talking about renovating. It's time yeah. goes by, yes. doesn't it? Yes, as, as I <laughs> renovate myself, we're yes. renovating the Dorothy Channel. Wow. So um, now your roots are in Stockton. Yes. Uh, you take the bar. Why did you take the bar in Los Angeles rather than San Francisco? Well, I took the bar in San Francisco. Oh, that's, I see. You got sworn in. in right. It. I was okay. sworn in down here, but uh, the bar was in July. And uh, looking for work, uh, as we all did. Uh, I was offered a job in San Francisco, but I was relatively newly married, and I, I decided, we decided that uh, we would prefer to be away from a metropolitan area and, 
and raise a family in a small community if we could. Uh, I loved San Francisco, but I had been living there uh, for three years. Uh, actually, for two years, I commuted the first year from Berkeley. But, uh, and I was offered a job at a large law firm where I had been clerking while I was in law school. But uh, we thought we'd look for something elsewhere. I preferred Northern California, but uh, uh, I didn't f find a, a place or a job and wasn't offered a job in a, in a situation that I, I thought uh, was good. But after I took the bar, uh, there was a posting at Hastings where I, the law school I went to uh, look for, by a lawyer who was looking uh, for an associate uh, in Southern California. I had only been in Southern California once before, so my then wife and I uh, decided we'd take a trip to Southern California, an interview for the job. Uh, we thought we'd uh, an opportunity for a free dinner, perhaps, and look around Southern California uh, for a couple of weeks and s see what it was like. So we came down and, and uh, I interviewed with uh, um, uh, a lawyer, Ed Beach, in the, in the small community of Santa Paula, which I found to be very attractive uh, at the time. And, uh, but we didn't look at it seriously, and we went back up north and continued the job search uh, as we were waiting for the bar results. And then I got a call, I received a call from uh, Ed Beach uh, asking to come back and uh, uh, re interview uh, because he was uh, serious uh, about uh, hiring me. And, and uh, I needed to get serious about it. Uh, so I went down and we, we met again. And he offered me a job. And my wife and I talked about it. And we took it. Uh, we liked him very much. Uh, it was an opportunity. He was a sole practitioner. And it was an opportunity to start a law firm. And uh, we liked the town of Santa Paula very much and thought it would be uh, a good opportunity for us and a place to settle down. Uh, so we came to, came in September. Uh, we came to Santa Paula and uh, with a little trailer behind my Hillman Minx uh, convertible. You know, I had a Hillman Minx. How you did, had a Hillman. I cannot believe this. That makes maybe two twins. people in the United maybe, maybe States. Maybe we're twins. <laughs> there were triplets. My mother never told us. Oh my heavens! Wow. You, well, How like many the, people what? have a Hillman Minx? I had a 1959 Hillman wow. Minx uh, convertible. <laughs> And in the color was a white called Moonstone. And my brother had a light blue Hillman Minx sedan. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> no wonder there's an affinity there. So, um, so, so you, anyway, yeah. and we, start, we started practice. Uh, I started the, um, practicing law actually in September, uh, three months before I was admitted to the bar, but doing things that you could do as a law clerk. Uh, yeah, I think the statute thought. of limitations may have run. So. I certainly hope so. <laughs> Especially for my practice. So, uh, so what kind of practice did you have? It was a general practice. Yeah. Uh, we did absolutely everything. Uh, uh, we, uh, there were four or five lawyers in town, mm -hmm. uh, maybe four. Uh, and there was a town at that time of twelve to 14,000 people. And uh, we did wills and estates. Uh, we did transactions. We did uh, ranch sales, land sales, business sales. Cattle rustling. Uh, no. <laughs> right. Well, we did personal injury work. Mm -hmm. uh, Ed Beach had, had developed a reputation as a as a personal injury lawyer. Uh, had sued the railroad very successfully on, on a number of occasions. Uh, in all kinds of I did a little workers' comp, and we also uh, Ed had a practice representing uh, Mexican Americans. Uh, Ed spoke Spanish uh, very well and. Uh, uh, so we had a significant clientele that was Mexican American, and and I uh, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed that aspect of the practice. The Mexican American community was a uh, was a joy to me. Uh, they were wonderful people. I didn't speak Spanish, and I uh, never picked it up very well. But uh, it was a wonderful small town practice uh, in those years. I could walk to work, and did, uh, and we had a small office. Uh, Terrific. And we grew over the years. We grew to have uh, five lawyers by the time I went on the bench. Uh, uh, we pract I practiced for, I think it was around 14 years. So you stayed with Ed Beach during stayed that Stayed with Ed Beach. Uh, it became, it. over time, uh, uh, it started out with Edwin Beach and then Beach, Stone, and Smith. And then St Ed went on the beach and uh, Ed, Ed went on the bench 
1969. And it became Stonesmith and Drescher. Uh, and then it became Romney, Stonesmith and Drescher. Uh, it went on uh, in various permutations and combinations until after I left in 1976 when I was appointed to the Superior Court. So now, now you, you were married, you had a couple of children. Yes, uh, I was married in 1960. We had two children. Um, they were born in 1962 and 64, a boy and a girl, Brian and Julie. Uh, we were divorced uh, in 1971, and uh, uh, I uh, eventually remarried or married again in 1988 uh, uh, to Kate McLean, and uh, uh, that marriage uh, has been totally and utterly successful. Yes, and uh, your um, your ex-wife. I now have grandchildren. Yes. And your, well, one of your daughters is, 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 is a lawyer? Right? Yes, my daughter Julie is a lawyer in San Francisco, and she has uh, three children uh, who uh, are in town as we speak. Right. Uh, they live up in, uh, up in Oakland, and, uh, but they're visiting down here now. And your son is uh, quite my a musician. My son is a symphony orchestra conductor, uh, and he is a professor at uh, uh, the University of Delaware. He got his master's and Ph.D. in conducting from the... Peabody Conservatory at uh, Johns Hopkins, and uh, he's enjoying what I think is a successful career there. And um, uh, we have uh, three wonderful grandchildren, and and uh, I have also a step grandchild who is equally wonderful. And uh, it's uh, uh, my ex-wife, uh, Catherine. You're very uh, good Catherine friends Stone. with Catherine Stone. Uh, uh, she went to law school uh, after we divorced and became a very successful lawyer uh, and lives on the beach uh, with her husband uh, now and we visit each other off and we travel together. In fact, you, uh, didn't you author some ar articles? Yes, she and I did a couple, yeah. of, uh, right. a couple of articles uh, on matters of mutual interest involving the law. Yes. And uh, so I've, it, it's, it's been a, a, an interesting, uh, eclectic life. So now, um, how'd you get on the court? How did that happen? Barely. <laughs> Barely, we all can say that. <laughs> but I mean, did you have any aspirations or thoughts uh, about being a judge? Uh, not, not years really. Before? When I, when, when, when I was practicing law in the '60s and early '70s, uh, uh, the general feeling that I had and the tradition that I had thought was that people became judges who were uh, lions of the bar, who came from silk stock, what I would call uh, silk stocking uh, law firms, that had family connections, political connections and were uh, politically active in uh, what I thought was generally uh, uh, the more traditional causes, uh, conservative causes, if you will, under today's standards. Uh, I, I know that, for instance, the ABA, the American Bar Association, was a generally conservative organization in those years. Now it's considered a relatively liberal, if you use those conventional labels, which I don't like, but uh, are, can be useful. Uh, so I, I, I had no aspirations to be a judge because it appeared to me that uh, uh, Jewish, immigrant, uh, Jewish immigrants who were practicing lawyers in the small towns, it was, that was not the thing of which judges were made. However, in 1974, when, uh, and I w but I was active in democratic politics at rather low, low local levels, not in terms of, of financial support. I never... I never was a financial supporter of any political causes uh, of any sort, but I was active uh, other than financially. I w was on committees. I helped uh, get out the vote. I helped uh, Democrats uh, get elected. Uh, I helped Democrats who didn't get elected. But uh, Jerry Brown became governor in 1974, and uh, I was a lawyer who represented uh, our, a local uh, gentleman Omar Raines, who became a state senator, and I represented him in his campaigns as a lawyer. Uh, he had two campaigns for the state senate, and he won both. Uh, he uh, had to fend off lawsuits from Republicans who uh, um, had campaign lawsuits, and I, I defended uh, Senator Raines in those matters, so I, I came to know politicians. Uh, he would seek out my advice from time to time, and uh, uh, legal matters uh, involving the legislature. Um, I went to Sacramento a few times to meet with him and you know, 
consult with him. He became chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, and uh, a new position opened up in Ventura County in 1975. Um, and uh, Senator Raines asked me if I had an interest, and I said I'd have to think about it because I never thought about being a judge. And I thought about it and discussed it with colleagues uh, uh, at the bar. And I decided after six or eight weeks to give it a shot. And uh, so I told Senator Raines of my interest, and he conveyed that to the state bar and to the governor's office uh, and the people who made the decisions in those days. I was interviewed. Uh, we didn't have the Jenny Commission at the time, so I was interviewed by the uh, Board of Governors uh, of the state bar and uh, uh, went to San Francisco and did some interviews there and uh, solicited support from the Ventura County Bar Association and some of the leaders of the bar and some of the lit litigators. And uh, eventually I was appointed in 1976 uh, and I took a seat uh, in early September of 1976 on the Superior Court and uh, served in that capacity until 19. 82 when I was appointed to the Court of Appeal. And I served in all capacities in the Superior Court, uh, Juvenile Court, and I think I met you, Arthur, uh, when you were doing uh, Juvenile Court work uh, on the Los Angeles That's Superior right. Court. We met at seminars and workshops uh, that were held, and uh, uh, we met at various workshops. We didn't know each other well uh, until we were both appointed to the Court of Appeal. But. All right. Now, um, um, your brother was also appointed to the Superior Court. Yes, he was. And I just uh, thought, it, here's twins, both on the he court. He was appointed. How did uh, that happen? Uh, interestingly enough, he, was, uh, he took the bench in Santa Clara County six months to the day after I took my seat uh, on the Superior Court of Ventura County. Now, he went a, a different route. He knew politicians, and he too was active in uh, what we like to call humanistic causes. Uh, uh, and uh, democratic politics. He was a friend of uh, Norm Mineta uh, and remains a good friend of his to this day. Norm Mineta at the time, I believe, was a congressman. And he knew the local politicians. Uh, uh, their names escaped me. I knew them too, but not very well. Who was that big fellow, very liberal guy in the assembly, uh, always uh, had his face on TV with some odd. He, the last I knew of him, he was fighting for uh, a law promoting self-esteem. Oh, uh, uh, oh, naturally. A very controversial guy. Yes, yes, I know exactly who you mean. <laughs> a I can big fellow, big burly guy. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, Doonesbury had so much fun. Yes, uh, right. Uh, writing, um, isn't that amazing? <laughs> okay. He was a friend of my brother's, along with people you knew, Mark Poche. Yes, that's uh, right. The fellow from Bolt, what was his name? His wife got him in trouble over the years. Oh, um, uh, Halvonic. Hal yeah, Paul Halvonic. Paul Halvonic. Very Halvonic. smart guy. That's a story. And an, and Someone an has to do an guy. interview about Someone has to interview him. Has to interview him. Yeah, right. Absolutely. But anyway, my brother knew those folks and knew Rose Bird. Yeah. So uh, he was, I talked to my brother. My brother was thinking of running for Congress. Uh, Norm Mandel was trying to persuade him to do that, but he, he didn't really want like elected politics. My brother at the time was the city attorney of San Jose, and, and had it was a position of some, how do I influence. And uh, but he, uh, I t had talked to him, and he saw how much I was just so much enjoying my work on the bench, and uh, so he decided uh, to give that a shot, and he was appointed. There you have it. And I swore him in. Oh, my goodness, how nice. That must have been terrific. Well, it was interesting because we looked much alike at the time. and There was a lot of photographers as I had him raise his hand wearing a robe and I raised my hand where, where, and we were facing each other. And they, those photographs were in uh, all over the press. And as a matter of fact, uh, it was either People Magazine or Us Magazine called us up one day and wanted to do a piece on us. And they hired a warehouse, someplace in a warehouse with a bunch of mirrors. Oh, yeah. And they yes. did a day you long. Do the Groucho Marx. Um, a day long photo shoot of us. Do you remember that scene in the Groucho Marx movie where he's dressed in um, 
Groucho is dressed in, uh, his, in a nightgown and someone else has a nightgown imitating him and he tries to make all these, he's looking in a mirror but it's not that's a mirror. Right. It looked, I could and see that's right. And that's pretty much uh, what, what they tried to do. That. But it was never published. It wasn't. Somehow it ended up on the cutting room floor. Oh my goodness. That would, it's still not too late. It's still not too Maybe late. Maybe we can put <laughs> something together. I think the, the film has probably deteriorated. Right, okay. So, uh, so you're on the Superior Court. Now, you've told us a little bit already about the Superior Court. You've had all these different assignments. And I do um, recall that you were um, awarded uh, Trial Judge of the Year by the Ventura Lawyers. Yes, I, was, uh, I, I loved my trials. I, I got that award twice in, in the six yeah. years I was on the bench. And, mm -hmm. and I, uh, of all you, as you know, Arthur, judges tend to get honored for this and honored for that. But uh, those were two that I valued because uh, these were the people who tried cases, and after all, the trial, that's what the trial court is all about, trials. We, we say everybody's entitled to their day in court. That's their day in court, the trial, whether it's criminal or civil. That's what it's all about, and, and, and to be honored by the lawyers who represent those people who have their day in court uh, was important to me. I, uh, it was something that I felt uh, uh, Warm the cockles of my heart. Well, I, um, not to embarrass you, but you were really considered one of the premier trial uh, judges in the state. You had that reputation. Everybody loved trying cases in front of you. It all didn't matter what side they were on, and it was a reputation that you kept throughout well, your judicial career. Interestingly, uh, you and I share some, some uh, I'll call it, uh, uh, we share some, some, some viewpoints. Uh, I like to call them attributes. And one of the attributes I think you and I share and that I'm proud of, and I think you should be too, is our sense of humor. I think you and I, Arthur, uh, are, are aware. We have a sense of the absurdity of, of some things that happen in life. And I think our ability to see the ironic side of that and if if I might, the humorous side of that. Uh, and I think it comes from similar heritages, uh, from families that have struggled over generations. Uh, to see those and to understand that uh, gives us, I think, a better understanding of the human condition and, and makes us better able to deal with it uh, in a neutral way to see that justice is done. And I think the use of humor, which you have written about and very eloquently, uh, I think we share that, and I think the, the gentle use of that that you and I both have done, and both in the trial courts as well as the Court of Appeal, I think has, has served our constituency well and perhaps served us well, well certainly I, in our personal lives and our personal attitudes. What I've noticed, too, about you is it was never at the expense of a litigant or anyone. I hope so not. So it diffused the tension in the courtroom, and it's as something that uh, mm -hmm. I think is been sort of inherent in this division. Uh, and I think people really enjoyed arguing in front of you and mm -hmm. presenting a case no matter how difficult it was because it, with you it was not a reign of terror, but it was, a, uh, it was an open, mm -hmm. frank discussion about things. Well, I've always thought that both in the trial court and in the court of appeal, frankly, it's a team sport. And uh, it's, it's a collaborative effort. On the trial court, I felt that uh, every trial was a team teamwork, and I was just the quarterback. Uh, but to be successful, the entire team had to work well together, and my job was to see that we, we all worked together well for a common goal, and the same on the Court of Appeal. It was a collegial, uh, it is a collegial court. It's designed that way uh, to maximize the best of three people, on, three justices on every case, and to take the best of each of the three of us, no matter who was the, the author of the case. But it, it had to, and I think the goal was, and I, I hope we had some success at it, that it was the best of the three of us, that the three of us could do. Uh, and it wasn't any given opinion uh, was the product of three people and uh, not the product of one person. Now, when our division was first created, uh, I, got, I think we got first -hand, uh, a first-hand example of your love of the trial court because um, you sat on the trial court for almost a year. Well, I did. Uh, but, of course, we didn't have a chambers, did we? We, we, we didn't we have had, a building. We had no real place to work. We had three small offices in a building across the street from the Ventura County Courthouse. But we didn't get the, those buildings for a while, did no, we? No, no. We were, uh, we were uh, 
the wheels of justice. Yes. We operated out of our cars. That's right. Uh, For the and first we, year. We had uh, a couple of hearings a month, and we would have those hearings wherever we could, whether it was in a courtroom in Santa Barbara or a courtroom in uh, Ventura or San Luis Obispo or the Board of Supervisors Chambers, whatever, wherever we could, we could hold court, we did. Now, I got a chambers down in Los Angeles. You did, and indeed. And so we maintained some kind of a presence in a court facility yes. uh, while we were looking for a building and that kind of, uh, and establishing ourselves. That's true. Uh, we, were, we were truly orphans uh, for a year or so. I don't remember how long. And then when we finally got office space, all we had was some small offices, a library, and a clerk's that's right. Uh, clerk's office, and we operated. And and you're right. I uh, I continue to sit on assignment in the trial court. And do your work on the court of appeal. And do my work on the court of yes. appeal as we uh, uh, we uh, we as we went forward. And we really never had a courthouse until we had yeah. this location That's right. in 1994, which was 12 years after we were invented. Do Do you recall? I'm. Uh, okay. Um, you know, one thing uh, I do recall, if I can just interject this, um, uh, when we finally got established as our division we in, a, in a real building and we had fairly nice chambers. Chambers were comfortable. They were offices, but they were nice. Um, I remember I said something to you about, Steve, it's time to cut the umbilical cord. And you said, next week I'm leaving the Superior Court. I remember <laughs> that. The, uh, <laughs> it, it, that was interesting because... Um, you know, I, I stayed and I was trying cases, and then when, as we got busier and, and got into the rhythm as a court of appeal, uh, I would go back about three or four times a year for a few days and try a few cases. And I did that for a couple of years, and then, and, and as, as you might recall, uh, Rose Byrd, our, our then Chief Justice, uh, felt very strongly at least my understanding, and, and we both knew Rose, I thought, rather well professionally anyway, uh, uh, she, she believed in the classless society. Uh, she did not believe in uh, separation or hierarchies uh, of any, any sort. That was my take on, on Rose. Uh, she, and she thought about equality and everything. And uh, uh, my conversations with her, I had told indicated to her on a number of occasions that I, I felt strongly that uh, appellate justices should sit occasionally and do trials so they don't forget, they don't get locked up in their ivory tower and forget how life in the trial court really is. And that trial judges should go to the Court of Appeal periodically so that they could understand the work and the mechanics as well as uh, the interplay between appellate courts and trial courts and how they do things. And uh, uh, Rose believed in that, and as a matter of fact, she brought municipal court judges of, and superior court judges of all stripe to sit on the Supreme Court from time to time, uh, whereas historically, only presiding justices of the courts of appeal sat on assignment to the Supreme Court. So I thought I had her full support uh, for sitting on the trial court periodically. But one day she called me up and she said, Steve, we really, you really do, we really need to have a separation between the courts. And uh, so I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't go back and, and uh, sit on the trial court. Uh, and I just said, but Rose. I didn't know uh, that. I thought we, we yeah. uh, agreed. Uh, I thought we had some agreement yeah. about these things. And she said, no, I, 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 I'd rather you didn't. And I said, okay. How inter I didn't know that. How interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, a number of Superior Court judges sat by assignment with us. Yes. In fact, she had that process. She had that pro and yeah. she and she and she did that a lot. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I got a mixed signal on that one. Hmm. Maybe Strange. somebody complained. <laughs> Some disgruntled trial litigant. What's he doing? So anyway, let's talk about our division a little bit. Um, we, um, uh, I do recall this. Um, some of the people smoked in the division. And Richard Abbey and I were strong anti-smokers. And maybe we'll just talk about this later. We got you to stop smoking. Yes, you did. And you were very uh, sensitive about it. And sensitive, I don't mean personally, but I mean towards us. 
And when we have a conference in your office, you remember what you had? You had a fan? You had a little fan on your desk, and you'd blow the smoke away from us uh, so we uh, wouldn't have to be exposed yeah, to I, it. I, I, I knew I was being objectionable, and I wanted to reduce, the, uh, that. I wanted we, to reduce that as much as I could. And um, um, you and, um, I mean, we just might mention briefly that I, I recall the trip you um, and Richard took to Nicaragua, Richard Abbey, our colleague. Um, didn't you go to Nicaragua with him? I, I didn't go to Nicaragua. Oh, he you was didn't. he was not he, on, went. he he went to Nicaragua and I went to Nicaragua separately. Separately with with a mutual friend. Okay. And the three of us went to Cuba. The three of us went to Cuba. In what, we, 1991 something like that. It was in either 1990 or 1991. Yeah, 90 or 91. Right. At a time when it was pretty difficult to get to Cuba, but we got there through a um, uh, a, uh, the government sanctioned it. Yeah, it this, was a study group. Uh, there was a loophole in the State <laughs> Department rules which permitted us to go to Cuba uh, to take a look at their legal system and their medical system because we went with a bunch of docs. We went with some doctors, uh, some teachers, and a, um, a journalist a and journalist? some lawyers. Yes. And that was really quite an interesting trip. Mm -hmm. We had a wonderful time. We, we had a good, and, it, and that uh, trip showed. Uh, I think a, a, a small aspect of the bonding the three of us had over the years as what we sometimes call the orphan division of the Court of Appeal because we didn't sit in the same building with the other uh, six divisions. And we're going to uh, keep it that way. And we're going to keep it that way. <laughs> and, so and we even made an effort, uh, yeah. uh, at least I made an effort, and I think uh, you guys felt the same way, to be our own district. We wanted to, to separate completely and be our own district. Well, uh, with hindsight, that was probably foolishness. No, I, I was opposed uh, to that. Actually. Oh, you were opposed yes, to that? Yes, I still so am. So you're the one who torpedoed yes, that. Yes, I hope so, and I hope I succeed. And, wise, and wisely so. I think I wisely, think. so and I think we're, so. we're good to be part of the second yeah. district. So, so we had this division, and we sort of formed our own kind of um, uh, uh, atmosphere. Yes. Uh, we never dressed up, did we? We never dressed up. We took a walk to the, we walked on the beach, and we, we rode our bikes. Uh, periodically uh, uh, from Santa Barbara to uh, to here or from here to Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. You used to stay overnight in Santa Barbara at Richard's house uh, when we had sessions up there and uh, we did a lot of things together that we uh, enjoyed as, as as friends and not just professional colleagues. We would have oral argument up in Santa Barbara and then we'd get on our bikes and ride down to Ventura. Yep. Now here's an interesting uh, point and where there was some legislation involved um, we were initially supposed to be the Santa Barbara Division. They called us that yes. in, the, in the legislation. Right. And, uh, but our cha and in fact, our chambers were supposed to be in, in Santa Barbara. Well, uh, <laughs> there was a division of, uh, <laughs> you say they were supposed to be. There's well, nowhere in the legislation did it say where they were. No, it didn't. It's just called the Santa Barbara okay. Division. And we were looking for, for uh, housing in Santa Barbara we did. initially. We did. And uh, we didn't find any. <laughs> <laughs> well, we found some, did we not? I think we felt that they were inadequate. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, they were, the, the rents were very, very high there. The rents were high, and they weren't, uh, my recollection is they weren't big enough. They, they just couldn't, it would be, it wouldn't last. Yeah. And uh, uh, I wanted to stay. I preferred to stay in Ventura in a way, although I love Santa Barbara, and I'd, I'd love to live there. I think as time went on, uh, uh, I think you, you were a little loath to go to Santa Barbara. You had, uh, you're from the west side of Los Angeles, from the Santa Monica area, the Palisades. You had a whole life there. Uh, I mean a whole life. And I remember uh, uh, having a, t a chat with you and, and Barbara, and I, I I could see that moving to Santa Barbara put uh, put Barbara, your wife's teeth on edge a little bit. Uh, it, was, it wasn't something that would, but it was a, a long schlep. Uh, I know that Richard Abbey would have liked to have been in Santa, have the court in Santa Barbara, because he because he moved to Santa Barbara and he loved Santa Barbara. And yeah. what's not to love except for the price? Now I recall uh, you went to the uh, bar associations and asked them if they really cared where. Yes, that's our, right. Our divisions were. 
and we talked to the uh, the president of the Santa Barbara Bar, the Ventura Bar, and the Ventura yeah. Bar, and the San Luis Obispo yeah. Bar, and said, "Hey, if we have our offices, and uh, do you recall what their response was? Nobody cared. Nobody cared. <laughs> Nobody cared." Uh, they said, go anywhere you want. They, absolutely. And, and I, uh, we t took, uh, we, we looked at, at the lawyer population of the three counties. Right. And interestingly enough, uh, there were just as many lawyers north of Ventura as there were south of Ventura. Uh, in fact, weren't there more lawyers in Ventura? In Ventura and Oxnard. Yes. And uh, wow. now... Yeah. Uh, now it's enormous. enormous. Uh, the weight is enormous. Uh, the South Ventura County, uh, well, Ventura County alone has about 1,500 lawyers, which is way more than uh, what's, what's in Santa Barbara and San Luis. It's just the nature of the growth pattern of Southern California. It just comes with, and you know probably better than I in the last eight, eight or nine years what the weight of your caseload is in terms of the three counties. And I, I I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know whether it's maintained that or not. So, um, and I think, and we asked the legislators, and they didn't care where we. Uh, no, nobody where we, cared. So we, and we were able to save the state a million dollars in rent over a ten-year period, by, by. By building a place here, and I, yeah. and I, I continue to believe that. Uh, well, I, I think this courthouse, the courthouse where where this interview is taking place, uh, has been a major contributor. Uh, to uh, a, uh, a piece of California, that is Ventura on the coast, uh, to maintain uh, the value, if I can put it that way, uh, of uh, a way of life in California that's rapidly disappearing. And I think but for this courthouse would, uh, the, would not have the kind of life that it does now. And, and just on a personal basis, our ability here to in the working in this courthouse to to walk down to the beach to mingle with the people on Main Street here in town uh, there's something there's a little left of To Kill a Mockingbird uh, ambiance if you will that is so missing uh, and disappearing and I uh, and I regret that I sound like an old guy I suppose but uh, it has some value that I think this division has kept and has has continues to keep under your leadership. Now you were instrumental in get in bringing this whole thing about and getting this building. Well, we all worked very on hard. It. You uh, worked uh, very hard for uh, this. We worked hard for it because we wanted it and we wanted it badly, and we thought it was important for the work of the court and important for the community. Uh, every courthouse is a major part of a community. Uh, if you look back over history, the town square where there were town meetings where decisions were made that involved the citizens. And this courthouse, I believe, plays no small part in that now, in our, our area. We used to have our oral argument <coughs> only in Santa Barbara. And we were called, initially, the Santa Barbara Division. Exactly. Do you recall why we, oh, we could only have our oral arguments in Santa Barbara? Because we thought we ought to. I Simply because we were the Santa Barbara Division. I think. Maybe there was more to it. Oh, no, that's right. But there was another factor, and that was, as I recall, and, and you brought about a change here uh, that I just happened to recall during this interview, and that is what uh, we were required to hold at least four hearings a year in Santa Barbara, according to the statute, because we were called the Santa Barbara Division, and the there was a statute that there required was an interpretation. that we have to meet at least four times a year in... in um, in Santa Barbara. Now, when we didn't have a courtroom, hey, we didn't care. And then when we established this courthouse, you got some legislation changed. Yeah, uh, it, it, I think there was more to that, to that. I think a court of appeal had to meet at least four times a year. I and think. one of those, and we met, we met in Los Angeles once a year because oh. there was some concern. No, we could do that. But I think we had to meet in Santa Barbara. Four times a year. Four times a yeah. year. And you had the right. legislation change. You called the legislators. Yeah. And I they have said. Some recollection. And you of that. said, and the, a statute was changed to allow us to have hearings in any of. Uh, right. Regular hearings in, in Ventura or any other, or any of the three. Any other counties. location in the tri counties. Yeah. We could do that. 
And we did feel uh, that it was important that we hold, conduct court, we hold our court out in other areas yes. uh, of our constituency. And we had a lot of fun doing it, and I know that you continue to have not just a lot of fun, but a lot of good professional uh, collegiality with the members of the bar uh, in what other people might think are the outlying areas. And uh, um, other courts of appeal uh, are doing that now, I understand. They go, they go to remote yes. locations from time to time. And of course, the Supreme Court has always done that with their meetings in Los Angeles, San uh, Los Angeles, Sacramento, and San Diego. And we're encouraged to do that by the Chief Justice, mm -hmm. Ron George, to have outreach to make the court as visible as possible. As a matter of fact, I think you made arrangements, Arthur, to have the Supreme Court sit in this very courthouse. Yes, that's right. And uh, I just, um, just, I remember uh, the Chief Justice calling, and he called me and he says, I have some good news and bad news. And I said, what's the good news? And he said, the good news is we're we're going to hold our hearings in Ventura for your new courthouse. And, uh, and we said, gee, that's wonderful. And the bad news, he says, three of your cases are on calendar. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> that so, true. so of those three, Arthur, how many were affirmed and how I many think, were reversed? Uh, I, do, I recall one was reverse seven to zip. I, I forgot about the other two. <laughs> well, I, I have a recollection that the first case that this division had in the California Supreme Court was reversed 7-zip. That's right. It was a criminal case. It was a criminal case, and it would have been, it was my case, it was my mm -hmm. case, it was a very liberal Supreme Court uh, case. I mean, a liberal Supreme Court, and the case had a more conservative, mm -hmm. if you will, um, holding that we all agreed upon. And then a subsequent Supreme Court uh, changed the uh, changed that decision and came back to my original idea. So everything that goes our around. original idea. The last case I had yes. as a justice on the court of appeal that went to the Supreme Court was reversed seven zip. It was a case where I held that uh, we held that uh, mm -hmm. if a construction if a in a construction defect case if it's bad enough you can get emotional damage. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. We knew we and were we got killed on that. I knew I shouldn't have listened to you on that case. <laughs> we, that was the last case that, I had. That was, your parting, that was your parting mm -hmm. shot. Now, you mentioned the DNA case uh, that yeah. you authored, uh, and I know you've done some very significant cases. Anything else uh, stand out in your mind that you... Well, there were two cases. Yeah. There were a couple of cases yeah. that, that uh, uh, I think were important uh, and that you played a major role in. Because at the time, the first, we, I did the first drafts on those two cases. I was uncertain as to what to do. And you, Arthur, uh, helped me come to what ultimately was, uh, and now obvious, uh, the correct decision. One of them was a case called Collier versus Menzel, in which uh, uh, some homeless folks uh, who gathered at the large Morton Bay fig tree in Santa Barbara wanted to vote, and the county clerk said, you cannot vote because you don't have a permanent street address. Um, uh, in other words, you needed to have a place with four walls and a ceiling on it in order to be a voter. And uh, um, in the first draft of the case, uh, uh, which was assigned to me, uh, we went the, I went the other way, and I was very uncomfortable with it. And you came in and said, you can't do this, Steve. And I said, well, you're right, Arthur. I can't do this. And uh, we rewrote it the other way so that uh, anybody could vote who had it, could identify a place where they could be found to provide the voting materials. And that's all you need to vote. And uh, I think it's important. I think it's an important principle. And you were a big help to me in that case. And um, uh, you should be proud of that. Well, you're, well thank you. Um, but but in you the know, other case, I have to just tell yeah. you, this case that you mentioned just recently, a lawyer called me, and that case was prominent in a major decision about voting really? in one of the local cities in um, L.A., Los Angeles County. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought you'd like to know that uh, your legacy lives mm -hmm. on because, uh, you know, this mm -hmm. case, our, our, all our opinions are, are, are collaborative efforts, and yes. we all realize mm -hmm. that. But, I mean, uh, th this was uh, a really wonderful decision that you, you wrote. I mean, we talked about it, but you crafted it mm -hmm. and got it together. And uh, so it still uh, has uh, uh, an important effect on California law. 
And so what's the other? Uh, Another one was uh, People versus Bulas. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> well, I remember that one. Yeah. That was a case in which uh, uh, members of the district attorney's office in Santa Barbara, as well as uh, members of the sheriff's office in Santa Barbara, uh, were uh, dealing with some narcotics cases. And uh, they, had, they had arrested a person by the name of Bulas. Uh, and in an effort to get him to roll over on his suppliers and the people who dealt the dope to him, uh, tried to persuade him out of the presence of his lawyer that his lawyer was also a doper uh, and was involved in the business and uh, the Bulas should uh, uh, roll over on the lawyer as well as some other people. Now, this was done out of the presence of his lawyer and we held that uh, that was a huge no-no, and uh, the district attorney's office, or let me put it this way, the government can't get away with that kind of an intrusion on a person's right to counsel, and uh, what should we do about it? And that was the debate. We were going to do something about it, but the debate was how far to go with it. And we felt that the intrusion was so significant, and the lesson had to be so carefully learned that we dismissed the case. Before it got to trial. Uh, before it got to trial. Uh, and it, it was a person who had confessed in this process uh, the, the, to, to uh, law enforcement that he was a doper or guilty of something. But we dismissed it and turned him loose uh, because we felt it was such an intrusion by the government that in these very unusual cases, which come up very rarely, uh, that uh, as a, the only appropriate sanction uh, was to dismiss the case. And Richard Abbey dissented in that case. I, I don't remember Yes, his he did. Dissent. I remember quite, yes, I, I remember his dissent. I haven't dissent. read it in a while. We'll talk about that later. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, he did dissent uh, very uh, mm -hmm. strongly. And uh, um, the Supreme, this case, I don't know what happened, but the Supreme Court never touched it. Because uh, we thought that... Well, I, I think for two reasons. Yeah. Number one, it was correct. And number two, they didn't want to take the... Uh, media and political flap, mm. flack that would, would, would happen uh, if, they, if they said it. And they let it be the law, and as far as I know, it's still, still the law. There. Oh, yeah. Mm. And um, it's good law. Yes. So now, um, what about your, you know, you mentioned a little bit about your judicial philosophy, and you talked about being open and warm and, and uh, to, to litigants. Uh, we talked about that a little. And also that, that you know, we all people are equal. We don't consider mm -hmm. the differences of people. Um, any other thoughts you have about the uh, about your approach to cases? Well, uh, one thing I, I, as an intermediate court of appeal or as any court of appeal, just basically, uh, uh, the the trial court uh, should be. Uh, respected and the decisions of the trial court should be respected, particularly that of juries. Um, uh, I, over the years, I have developed a greater and greater respect uh, for the jury system and for juries. Uh, I personally believe that juries get it right more often than judges do. Judges often, too often, get uh, bogged down in some side issue or some detail. Uh, and they don't look at the big picture. They don't look at what re what's really going on. Well, juries do. And uh, you need, in the civil case, only nine out of 12 jurors. The three crazies drop off and the nine get it right. Uh, and I've learned to value that. And, and we had a case here in this court, Arthur, uh, where I valued the jury verdict more than uh, you and the others. It was a case coming out of San Luis Obispo in which uh, uh, an expert who you didn't think was so expert testified and, and moved millions of dollars from one side to the other. And I, and I said, that, look, the jury spoke, the jury heard the evidence. Uh, the evidence wasn't crazy. Uh, you know, they look at it differently perhaps than we do, but my, I want to leave it alone. And uh, you and I can't remember who else was on the case. I think Paul Richard Coffey? was Richard? on the case. No, no, Paul Coffey was Paul the trial judge. Paul Coffey was, was the trial, the trial judge. judge. That's right. But uh, who now sits on this. I court. ended up uh, dissenting. I think yes. it was. And and and, and th what that is, that's I say that only to point out uh, my 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 uh, 
value, how much I value uh, juries generally. They get it wrong now and then, and we're here to, to, to stop that. You know, we're here to thing, prevent a miscarriage. But uh, One thing uh, that I'm glad you mentioned that, because if you recall in this division, uh, not only was there never any bad blood about a dissent, but we would help each other with our dissents. Yes. That yes. Is, we might discuss that yeah. a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 that's true because uh, I think we all understood the value of dissents because a dissent is an opportunity uh, to directly uh, present a, a different viewpoint. Uh, and uh, those of us who would be on the majority uh, would want that dissent to point out the important differences and the choice that was made by the majority over the dissent. And the better the dissent is written, uh, the sharper it is in terms of intellect, in terms of its intellectual honesty uh, and directness, uh, helps us better craft the majority opinion. And I say that both vice versa. And uh, we, have, we all know that dissents in other courts have been biting, have been personal. Uh, have been acrimonious and tends to increase the separation uh, uh, to a degree that shouldn't be there. Uh, dissents are intellectual and philosophical, uh, generally speaking, and it should be that way without rancor and with respect uh, because I think that that highlights the opportunity to present two op opposing views. They don't happen to be equal, it's two to one, <laughs> but uh, Dissents really have their value, and that's another thing about Richard with his dissent license plate. Yes, and his license plate said dissent on it. That's right. Um, you know, um, you um, have been very outspoken about your beliefs uh, and views and always express them in a principled way uh, when you, w while you were on the court as well. And I do recall something that really made an impression on me, and that is your... Um, uh, your feelings about the death penalty. And I recall that while you were on the court, and incidentally we're up for reconfirmation by the voters, and uh, you were, did a radio interview in which you were sitting as a, as a, as a jurist. Uh, now, of course, we don't hear death penalty cases on the Court of Appeal. That's why I felt comfortable yeah. discussing it. But uh, I thought that was quite courageous. And if, you just, if you'd like to just summarize your feelings about that. Well, in, in terms of the death penalty, uh, um, there are, are, are two basic reasons I'm against the death penalty. One is uh, that I don't believe the government should have the power to kill anyone for any reason. It, it is a, a, a power of the government that, uh, in my view, goes too far. And that is because uh, I am a child of the Holocaust, in a sense a Holocaust survivor. I know, personally speaking, uh, how many members of my family, uh, and it was a great number, were killed by the government in Europe, were killed by the German government, and subsequently with the cooperation of the Austrian government. Uh, and I don't want any government on this planet to have that power. Uh, it's just too much power, and because the government has so much power in its judicial system, or however it wants to work, administratively, through the executive branch, or any other branch, they can kill, and I don't want them to do that. I don't want to give them any route to that. The other reason is, that certainly here in California and probably in most of the other states that have the death penalty, the cost is enormous. The fiscal financial cost to kill somebody uh, in this state uh, by use of the death penalty costs way more. I don't, that's not a very sophisticated phrase, but a, a great deal more by magnitudes geometrical magnitudes uh, than to keep them alive, uh, than, to, than to keep them uh, in prison for life. Uh, just the economic cost of it. We can't afford it. Not only that, we can't find the lawyers to defend them. So we are killing people 20 to 30 years, 20, 25 years, whatever it is, uh, after coming. It's almost pointless. It's almost pointless. I sentenced, to, I reluctantly sentenced a person to death in 19... 80, I believe it was, that person isn't even close to exhausting his appeal. Think of it. 27 years later, this person is still in the 
uh, federal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, with a couple of cases that they can't decide whether, whether to affirm or not. What a waste of judicial resources, for goodness sakes, for goodness sakes. Thank you. I can see you feel as strongly as you did and your eloquence has not left you. So um, tell me a little bit, um, uh, well, I, mean, I just want to touch briefly on your retirement and what you, I use that term uh, advisedly because you're working hard, probably as hard as you ever have. Um, any other thoughts about the, about the court? I know we had one period of time when we had an, a horrendously large caseload. We were doing 190 or 175 yes. to 190 cases per year per judge. That's exactly right. There was a caseload. It's not like that now. <laughs> you <laughs> Congratulations. But uh, it was pretty tough, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Th there, were, there were times yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 where we had to work very, very hard to get a timely uh, decision out uh, that was well-reasoned, well-crafted, and not rushed through. There was, it and, was difficult for And we never to wanted to have cases uh, on our shelves, so we really worked. We put in extra hours. We did. Uh, we, for years, we were essentially the most, uh, we, we, we got our cases done uh, quicker uh, than any other division in the state, or certainly as quick. Uh, and, and, I, and I think we knew and understood that uh, it's a trite phrase, but justice delayed is justice denied. We felt very, we would get a case out in seven months where some other division would take five years. Yeah. Uh, now, and, and that isn't right. You, um, when did, you retired in what, 19, 1999. 99, I recall, remember that. And uh, that was a little of a, a kind of an emotional time for us that you were For leaving. all of us. I was yeah, the first it, justice to retire. Yeah. And no, no, I was the second, actually. Richard retired. That's right. Richard retired. Um, what, what prompted you to retire? Um, for my my, re my uh, pension had vested completely. Uh, I was getting a little itchy to get back on the street. Um, by back on the street, I mean dealing directly with the litigants and lawyers on a nose-to-nose, -nose, face -to -face, not in a controversial way, not in an adversarial or advocacy way. I also had been in the system for a long time and had done all of the jobs, so to speak, that you can do in the system. I felt I had something to contribute uh, back on the street, so to speak. Uh, and use everything that I had learned uh, in a different way to get people out of the system of litigation. Uh, litigation is the, is the best system on earth to ultimately resolve a dispute. But there are problems with litigation, time and money and diversion. Uh, and I, I got the feeling that the question that was answered by us in the Court of Appeal in a written opinion was not the question the people went to their lawyers with some years before. A different, different questions got answered, almost always correctly, but the case had morphed. The case had changed. Discovery changes at the law changes, at the lawyers changes, at the judges change, at the juries change. And the litigants will have lost control. The real people lost control. I wanted to go back on the street and deal with the litigants directly with their own issues and get those resolved years before they would get resolved in litigation. Litigation is expensive. It's time consuming. It takes people away from what they really ought to be doing, whether it's in business, at home, or anything else. Litigation is a good thing and it's a bad thing. And I will, so after, I don't know, we figure out the years in the business of litigation, I now work every day, full time, getting people out of litigation and getting them to resolve the disputes themselves. All I do is assist them to make their own decision. And I think there's something, well, I, I'm not sure how, I think there's something morally and intellectually and even spiritually wise about people resolving their own disputes and not handing them off to third party third parties, whether they be judges or juries or arbitrators, uh, but to, to cut their own, make their own peace, cut their own deal. Uh, and to the extent I can help people do that, 
uh, there's something uh, not magical about it, but it's something that makes me sleep well on those occasions when I can pull it off. Well, you've made and it. All I do is help them yeah. make no mistake. I don't decide anything. I just help them cut their own deal. And I, I, it's a different aspect. It's not litigation. It's the antithesis of litigation. But it's something very valuable. And it's an opportunity to be my own, to do my own thing. I, there's a certain freedom to it uh, that I can do it. And uh, it's great. It, it, but make no mistake, it is, not, it, it is something else now that I do with the same joy that I had on the Court of Appeal and the same joy that I had as a lawyer and as a Superior Court judge. You've made the it's most not different. eloquent argument I think I've heard for mediation, <coughs> which is what you're doing now. Which is what I'm doing. <coughs> and uh, not to embarrass you again, but your reputation is, is uh, I think it's uh, gone beyond the borders of, of California because we know that people who want to use your services have to book uh, a year in advance or so. You're so busy. It's really I, quite remarkable. I am happy wonderful. to go anywhere, particularly Hawaii yes. or elsewhere, for, <laughs> to serve my clients. <laughs> so you're having a very uh, uh, fulfilling um, uh, life now. It is. Uh, I, I think that's a good word, Arthur. I, it is very fulfilling and at times uh, overfilling. Yeah, uh, you're so busy. But, uh, and I just, and I want to, you know, and I, and I really want to thank the court's project, a legacy project, for an opportunity to reflect uh, uh, on the system that we've all served and continued to serve. And I think this kind of reflection uh, is something wise to preserve. Now, as I was telling our videographer, I don't know that anybody's ever going to see this or hear this, uh, since it's on a voluntary basis. Uh, but to make the record, I think, uh, uh, has some importance, and even if it isn't important, it's a joy to me to do it. Well, it's a joy to have had this experience uh, talking with you. I want to ask one last question, if I may, um, and that is, um, you've seen the court system and the legal system over, uh, over uh, you know, several decades. I guess we both have, and uh, you've been on this court and then the trial court, and you're still dealing with the courts in a way from mm -hmm. a different perspective now. What, do you see any major changes or differences uh, insofar as civility is concerned or, or lawyering or the profession uh, from what, the judiciary what, viewpoint? What, 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 has, and the what, what has changed uh, is the practice of law. Uh, when uh, we started the practice of law, you couldn't advertise. Everything was word of mouth. Uh, your, uh, your reputation was based on your conduct uh, and your skills solely and only. Um, the change came with a case called Bates versus Osteen, Bates, Bates and Osteen versus Arizona, I think it was, uh, which permitted lawyers to advertise. That changed the practice of law to the business of law. Uh, the business of law made it very competitive uh, and different factors entered in to the profession. It's still a profession, but it's also more of a business. Uh, marketing became important. We never even heard the word marketing in connection with it. And that has changed things. It has made the system more adversarial than I think it was intended. Uh, and uh, so there has been a dramatic loss of civility because people think that uh, you market well when you beat people up and become a, quote, winner, close quote. Uh, that has changed things. It has changed the way disputes are resolved in court. Uh, and uh, uh, the tone of the legal debate has coarsened over time, uh, I think because of that. Uh, and the courts have had to deal uh, with this change. And it's made it harder for judges, I think, especially in the trial courts, to deal with these things. Uh, they are uh, assaulted. They have to deal with verbal assaults in the courtroom far more often than they used to. And uh, we're poorly equipped to do that. It's not a good thing. It diverts the litigation away from the litigants. Lawyers have a tendency in this competitive age and marketing age that they are there to serve the clients. They're there to get that dispute resolved in some way that's helpful to their clients. And that has been lost to a certain extent. And, and it's coarsened what we do made it a little more difficult to do what we do. Uh, 
uh, that has been a change also. The other change has been the political influences on judicial selection. I think that's, uh, with, with, with the advent of uh, instant media, uh, instant uh, sharing uh, in technology, it's too easy to torpedo something. Uh, everybody knows everything about everybody, and people's warts get magnified by their opposition. And uh, it makes it hard. Nobody's perfect, so who's ever uh, involved in judicial selection, uh, whether it be the judicial nominee or the people that make the choices, uh, it has become another uh, course in public soap opera. It makes it more difficult. And, uh, there are good things about it and there are bad things about it. And it's made it more difficult and, and more problematic. Well, thank you for a very informative and interesting interview. Thank you. We've got to go to Richard Abbey now.